Howdy everyone, and once again I'm hopping into the old time machine to check out how some of Canon's legacy digital SLR lenses work here in 2023 in the age of very high resolution cameras. This time we are going back 10 years to 2013 to check out the Canon EFS 55-250mm f4-5.6 IS STM. Don't mix it up with the original non-STM version of the lens, this newer STM version of it has greatly improved autofocus and sharper optics too. It's still available today for US$300 or about £300 here in the UK and it was originally designed for Canon's APS-C digital SLR cameras. So it will work on the old 2000D, 4000D, 250D, 850D, 80D, 90D and other Canon APS-C digital SLR cameras. It will not work on Canon's full frame digital SLR cameras at all, it's designed not to physically even fit onto them, but it will also work on Canon's mirrorless cameras, EOS M or EOS R system if you have the appropriate adapter. As you can see, I'm adapting it here onto my EOS R7. If you choose to adapt it onto one of Canon's full frame EOS R mirrorless cameras, then it will work, but only in a lower resolution cropped mode. I hope that all makes sense. And the chief attraction of this lens is obviously its great zoom range, the full frame equivalent of 88 to 400 mm. That is absolutely brilliant for all kinds of telephoto photography, picking up where a wider angle 18 to 55 mm kit lens might leave off. Its maximum aperture of f4 at the wide end, narrowing to f5.6 as you zoom in, means that it can't get you the most out of focus backgrounds or snappy shutter speeds, but still, if you zoom in then some nice portrait shots will be available to you. The lens also features its own image stabilisation, here's some footage with it turned off and now turned on. While the stabilisation isn't rock steady, it's still doing a good enough job for a 10 year old lens shooting at the equivalent of 400mm. Let's take a look at the build quality. The lens's body is quite cheaply constructed with no weather sealing around the rear and even a plastic lens mount and it tips the scales at a fairly lightweight 375 grams. However, it's actually quite solidly constructed. It feels nice in the hand and doesn't have any wobbly parts to it. The lens has external switches for auto manual focus and for the image stabilizer, something I always love to see. Then comes the rubberized zoom ring. This copy of the lens is virtually new and my zoom ring turned lovely and smoothly with only a little bit of stickiness to it. In front of that comes the rather loose and freely turning focus ring which is electronically coupled to the focus motor. In use it works really responsively as you can see here and the lens exhibits very little in the way of focus breathing. The lens's autofocus motor is from the early days of Canon's STM design but still it focuses very quickly, smoothly, accurately and silently. I had no problems with autofocus here at all. The lens has a 58mm filter thread size and it does not come with a lens hood although one is available separately. Overall, while the build quality is rather basic, the lens actually works fantastically well with good stabilisation and autofocus and a nice smooth zoom ring and I also think it looks pretty cool there on my EOS R7 with the adapter. Ok, let's take a look at image quality now. The lens originally performed pretty well on my old Canon 70D with its 20 megapixel APS-C sensor. The 325 megapixel sensor of my EOS R7 will be a different ballpark altogether though. In camera corrections are turned on for these tests. At 55mm and f4, the lens is rather soft in the middle of your images, corner image quality is about the same. Stop down to f5.6 for a little improvement in those corners, but back in the middle, image quality is way sharper now, looking very nice and detailed. Stop down to f8 and the middle looks about the same, but the corners now see another improvement, looking reasonably good. Stop down to f11 though and the lens begins to soften again due to the effect of diffraction and f16 looks very poor for the same reason. So at its widest angle, stopping down to f5.6 yields a huge benefit. Let's zoom in about halfway to 135mm. The maximum aperture has now darkened to f5. In the middle of the image, again, the picture quality is rather soft. 
Strangely, the corner image quality is actually just a little sharper here than in the middle, although that kind of thing is not unheard of. Let's top down to f8 for pretty sharp corners, and back in the middle, another huge improvement. Once again though, if you stop down to f11, then the lens just gets a little softer again due to diffraction. Finally, let's zoom all the way into 250mm. Add the new maximum aperture of f5.6, once again, the lens is rather soft in the middle of your images and over in the image corners too. Let's top down to f8, and the corners look about the same, but the middle of the image looks decently sharp now. Stop down to f11, and the middle looks the same, but the corners see just a tiny improvement. Again though, stop down further than that, and diffraction will just soften the image too much. Overall, I was a bit disappointed by the performance of this classic lens, because I was hoping its sharpness wide open would be much better than this. But for those of you willing to stop down your aperture by just one stop throughout the lens's zoom range, you'll be able to get a decent performance out of it. Ok, let's turn off in-camera corrections and take a look at distortion and vignetting. At 55mm, we see some very mild barrel distortion being projected by the lens. However, even at the brightest aperture of f4, there's little in the way of vignetting. If you zoom in, then that distortion flips into a mild pincushion pattern instead, with vignetting falling a little more heavily. Stop down to f8 or f11 for those corners to brighten up very well, so overall, that's a pretty good performance for vignetting and distortion. This lens has a bit of a bonus feature in that, when you zoom right in, it offers great magnification, getting you nice and close to even very small subjects. At f5.6, close-up image quality looks a bit soft and hazy here, with some purple fringing around contrasting edges. Stop down to f8, and we see a return of contrast and good sharpness, though. Let's see how the lens performs against bright lights now. The lens displays surprisingly little flaring when bright lights are in the picture, whether you're zoomed out or zoomed in. However, there's certainly some glaring around the bright point of light itself, still a good performance overall. And finally, let's see about the quality of this lens's bokeh. Out of focus backgrounds just look averagely smooth here, nothing special, but nothing too distracting either. Overall, well, the biggest takeaway from this retest for me is that I wish the lens had turned out to be sharper when shooting it at its brightest apertures. It's definitely soft there, and you will notice that softness on a 24 megapixel APS-C camera too, I'm sure. You can top it down for some very good resolution though, which will please landscape photographers, but for bird and subject photography, where a more diffused background is desired, or faster shutter speeds, you will have to settle with a somewhat soft image. In all other areas though, the lens does perform pretty well. If you're willing to stop down its aperture a little, then this could be a decent enough lens to buy, if you can find it for a bit less than $300, that is. Cool, another classic lens retested for 2023. I think those are the main Canon ones out of the way now, although maybe I'll cover some more in the future if enough people watch these reviews. Thank you for watching, and a huge thank you to all my supporters over on Patreon for your generosity, which is what's keeping this channel going sponsorship free. Check out my Patreon page in the description below for all kinds of exclusive bonus content, and ciao for now.